Morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. And welcome to this replay. If you're not watching it live at 9 a.m. Eastern, we go live every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern um, with different topics, uh, different interviews. Uh, we're doing um, monthly enrichment and Q&As. So I see people starting to come in. And good morning. Hey, everybody. Morning, Sharon. <clears throat> everybody got their cup of coffee, ready to go. Let's do this. Um, morning, Dawn. Good morning, Tim. Everybody, um, thanks for everybody for returning. Good morning, Pat. Good morning, Chris. Happy New Year, everybody. Hopefully, everybody had a great Christmas. Good morning, Allison and Mano. <clears throat> it's been a weekend full of live streaming. Good morning, Jennifer. I see a lot of people in here that are joining from our membership program and um, a lot that, <clears throat> excuse me. Good morning, Beth, Bobby, uh, Jennifer, a lot of people that are returning every week for Coffee with the Critters. Good morning, Heather. Um, so we have been getting a lot of feedback from you guys um, saying how you guys look forward to you guys look forward to the coffee with the critters every morning or every Sunday morning. And we've been hearing that um, you're watching us live with your family and um, from the big, from your big screens. <laughs> That's a little scary for me. Um, no co-host today. No, Chris. Good morning, Lori. I decided to do this one from the office within my house. <clears throat> since it's a Q&A, but um, throughout the weekend, we've been doing live streams, Q&As for the projects, for the memberships, and I'm just kind of experimenting different places where you guys may enjoy uh, Coffee with the Critters better. Good morning, Nancy and Rhonda. Um, so I know a lot of times I do this from the center. Sometimes I do it from the training room. I broadcast from the training room with Milo. We did some impromptu uh, training with Milo, the pig, yesterday in our level, level two um, live stream Q&A, which worked out really well. So the downside about me being in my office is I can't stand up and do a demonstration for you with an animal. Um, so good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. I see everybody joining from all over the United States and different parts of the world. Good morning, Tambry. Um, yeah, so good morning, Deb. Hey, Deb, you've been requested in our membership program to do an interview with you. So I'm going to be getting a hold of you um, here fairly shortly. We are designing, we're getting ready, our schedule ready for 2018. And um, a big kudos to help from manager Karen Pratt and our social media director, Crystal Phelps, for helping us with that. So you're going to be seeing a lot of things changing. Um, so as we get started, um, good morning, everybody. For those that are new, my name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We are an international educational center where we teach people around the world um, how to interact with um, animals and learning um, using applied behavior analysis and positive reinforcement. And we do that through our live streams. If you want more engagement and want more in-depth learning, take a look at our website um, for the projects and the memberships. And there's our website. Good morning, everybody. Love the holiday frame. Thanks. Hey, Nancy Forrester. Um, Shelly says you and Deb are great to, together. Deb and I, I think we make a pretty good team, uh, delivering great content with, um, a lot of education application and fun. So let's go ahead and get started. This is, uh, today we're going to be doing a Q and a, um, hopefully everybody, is having a great holiday and has made it through the holidays. I know in our membership program, we're talking about um, how guests can knowingly or unknowingly untrain the animals in our household. <laughs> has anybody had that happen? 
has everybody had a great Christmas? And um, hopefully not too many animals were untrained during the holidays. Um, just getting some messages coming in saying people are loving the live streams. Great. Um, like I said, this is, good morning, Jill. This is our, we're going to try to incorporate a monthly Q&A. <clears throat> um, I just finished listening. I'm listening and reading all the time. If you could see to the left of me, there are stacks of books um, on applied behavior analysis um, in its application. But I just got done listening to a really fascinating podcast um, on um, concerns in the use of, hi, Ryan, concerns in the use of how the evolution of um, personal interaction is changing and the impact that um, technology is having on that, um, especially within the classroom. So you guys know that applied behavior analysis works across the board on anything and everything. And they were talking about how it's true. It was really mind stimulating how cultural evolution via technology is moving a lot faster now than natural selection. So um, good morning, Brianna. I know that, um, hey, evolution happens um, and we're gonna have to figure out what, how that can hurt us because Technology is moving so fast um, that there, I mean, as you guys know, when we work with animals, Don, hi, there's a blast from the past. As we're working with animals, animals can't really speak, so we have to rely on their body language, um, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time. That's why teaching is communication, and the downfall but I, I'm not sure this is a downfall because I see technology evolving. Um, what they were saying was the downfall in that was that um, kids and people texting now can't read um, body language through what's being said behind the text. But I'm sitting there thinking, I was like, but that's changing. That's changing fast. Um, <clears throat> because now look at our live streams. Uh, you can read my body language. You can hear the inflection in my tone of voice. You can uh, hear my sarcasm, <laughs> which I'm a very sarcastic person once you get to know me. <laughs> um, but you can read that now in the live streams. And I was going to try to do this, this episode, but I'm, I think I need to test it. But let's have um, the next episode in... Um, our Q and A's. I'm going to set it up more like a talk show. Um, sarcasm is something we have in common. Deb, we have a lot of things in common. Sarcasm, fun, <laughs> and many other things. <laughs> I, and I tell a lot of people, I just like to have fun. I like to have fun. Um, and your world can revolve around having fun. If I'm not having fun, it definitely shows. Um, <clears throat> But one thing I'm going to do in the next Coffee with the Critters is I can set this up. Uh, this will be in the next q and I'm going to set this up like we can have three people on at once. And instead of because I want to see I get to know you guys through my live streams and. I want to hear and see what you're saying versus just reading your comments on the screen. So, hey, Joe, go get your coffee. <laughs> um, so you have the option in the future, if you have a question, I can pull you on the screen. My screen will divide into half or thirds, and we can sit here and communicate with each other, and you can jump on and ask me your question. We've been testing this in our memberships and um, our projects, and it's really cool because, like, I can – I can tag somebody or ask you guys to tag somebody and it pulls them into the live stream. They have the option if they want to go live with me, but I think that would make it, I would, it would make coffee with your critters so much more personal and engaging. 
Um, sarcasm is being real. I love real people. Thanks, Shelly. <laughs> um, I like to have fun through my sarcasm. Um, I just don't do that right in the beginning um, because I need people to get to know me first. <laughs> um, so we've been testing this in our live streams, but some of you are probably laying in bed watching who's still in bed watching coffee with the critters from their mobile device. <laughs> um, yeah, streaming. Rhonda says streaming will be a lot faster and it is evolving on a daily basis. Um, I'm taking a couple different classes right now um, to do, do, do the best content in those classes are uh, my classes I'm taking are on um, subscription memberships um, and bringing social media into that. So Chantel is still in bed. Yay. <laughs> Lori's still in bed. Beth is still in bed. Oh, Danette is taking a bath. So we may not want to bring that into the live stream, Danette. <laughs> Janine's still in bed. Janine's um, from Alberta, Canada, just outside of, uh, well, she's from Edmonton. So you guys are joining us very early. Um, Jill's still in bed. Everybody's still. So that's fun to hear how many people are still in bed and attend Coffee with the Critters. Um, Emily still is um, attending Coffee with the Critters <laughs> in bed. That's fun. I know. I have to start this at 9 a.m. Eastern here in Northwest Ohio because I have animals that need training. Um, 6 a.m. in Washington. Beth and everybody in Pacific time. Thanks for getting up and joining us so early. Um, so let's get started with our Q and A's. Awesome. We already have 65 people on here live with us. And I want to thank you guys for your support because our coffee with the critters is growing fast. The animal behavior center is growing fast. Um, and we are taking all of our business and trends. We're putting, I would say 90% of our business is now <clears throat> online through our live streams. Um, so we can reach people all over the world. We have people in our memberships and our projects. Good morning. Happy New Year's Eve, everybody. We have people in our projects and our memberships from all over the world. Um, we have several from Mexico. Um, Australia, Germany, Japan, Poland. Yes. Terry's been up for hours. Of course you have, Terry. Good to see you. Um, good morning, Nita. Let's get started with, um, let's see, is there anything else I wanted to say? Yeah. I want to say one more thing before we get started with the Q&A. Um, because, good morning, Sylvia, up there in Canada. Happy New Year to you. Um, one of the people I am going to be bringing on here very shortly, we're scheduling the interviews in Coffee with the Critters, one interview per month. Um, one of the people I have reached out and contacted, several of you know, through here um, on Coffee with the Critters and through attending our events, is BCBA, Board Certified Behavior Analyst, Joel Vitovic who it is an honor to have him. He's right here in Toledo, Ohio. And we just recently found out about each other about a year and a half ago. And uh, he and I are collaborating with several different things. Hey, Puffy, good morning down there in North Carolina. Um, we're collaborating on several different things. And there are those people. You guys tell me who you want to see interviewed. Tell me. Um, if I can jot them down right now, I will. And if not, you guys know I go right back through my live stream on Coffee with the Critters as soon as this is over, and I respond to each and every comment if I cannot respond to it here via live. Um, tell me some of the people you'd like to see interviewed here on Coffee with the Critters. Um, we, I've reached out to several people. Diane's, Diane's from Long Island, and she knows Joel. She met him here. Um, Joel Vitovic is one of those people that I could listen to all day. When his brain starts pumping out information through his mouth, I just drool. Do you have a website where I can learn your lessons? Um, yes, we do. That is right here, the animalbehaviorcenter.com. Victoria Stillwell. Um, awesome. 
we have her written down for the projects too. We, I just recently finished a podcast where I was interviewed right after Victoria Stillwell, Nancy Forrester. Um, okay, Nancy, hey, Nancy, you're on here, aren't you, Nancy? Ever okay? A lot of people are saying Nancy Forrester. Let's see. I don't want to put her on the spot, but she is attending this live stream. Um, let's see the lady you made chop with. That would be Patricia son, Tim, um, Barbara and Jason. I do have Jason in the works of being, um, he's already agreed to it and we'll be bringing him on. I'm just trying to schedule him. And if you guys need to get a hold of me, there's my email address that comes right to me and I answer every single email. Um, Nancy says, how about when I come to Key West? Yeah, let's do that. Um, I'll write down. So my trip to Key West keeps getting delayed. Um, and we are now probably looking at Nancy coming down for my birthday, which was a year ago the last time I came down. That is in middle of February. Thanks, Eva. Yeah, Eva just put up our website. Um, no coffee mugs for your birds. Yeah, my coffee mug this morning is used to be one of my favorites. Um, now Rico is my favorite. Uh, Drayton Michaels, Lydia says. I think I just listened to a podcast with him. Let me know the names of the people and the topics. We have Jason scheduled. He's getting ready to come on. Um, I also have Dr. Karen Becker will be coming on and joining us. Um, I've been in touch with several different people. Um, Joel is going to be coming on and joining us. So if you don't respond here on this live stream, let me know. Send me an email. Um, just trying to catch up with your comments. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. So, um, yeah, someone from AFA. That, writing that down, Ray. AFA, American Federation of Aviculture. I would like to get some people on here from different shelters, different educational institutions. I don't know what else to call besides institution. Um, so, Alexandra, okay. What organizations are you a member regarding? Let's see. I'm not sure. I didn't see that whole comment, Mano. Um, what topics do you want to see? Let me know. So last week we had our um, parrot behavior. Okay. What organizations are you a member of regarding training in ABA? Me? Me personally? Hello, Allison. Um, I'm a member of ABAI, Applied Behavior Analysis International. Um, you guys saw me live stream from there uh, this past, am I a member or have I not renewed my membership? <laughs> um, you guys saw me live stream from there in Colorado, Dr. John Robb. Um, ABAI has a, that's also where I interviewed Joel Vitovic back in May from Denver. Um, ABAI has an annual convention this year. I believe it's in San Diego. I was going to submit Scott Eccles. We, yep, we've got that written down, Bobby, for the Parrot Project. Um, I was going to submit to present this year, but my year is not totally booked, but pretty booked. Uh, so I'm thinking I may submit to present in 2019, and I have a great topic. I'm going to submit on. Um, so ABAI is primarily, I also belong to a signature group, um, a special interest group in ABAI uh, for animals. Okay, I'm going to have to go through and um, relaunch, we watch the live stream. Potbelly pigs, okay, Denise, yeah. We were just talking about Milo. 
uh, because we're having some behavior concerns with Milo. And um, we live stream that in the pig project. Yesterday we live streamed that in uh, lover, lover, membership level two. Um, yeah, so people tell me that it's they like it, that it's good to hear that um, we have behavior his issues here as well. Of course we do. Of course we do. Um, we always, we don't always do, but um, it happens frequently and our behavior issues will rise that I see that rise in our animals when the training stops or is lacking. As you guys hear me say, behavior doesn't lie. And um, a couple of those behavior issues we're seeing right now, and this is commonplace. The, the animals, this is where I see it take place very commonly, and it happens here as well. Um, not as often, but the animals that are not showing undesired behaviors, we tend to not train them as much because there are no behavior issues. Um, depression in animals, I was just talking about, we're going to bring in um, some neuroscientists on and into um, the memberships to talk about um, emotions, feelings of guilt uh, in animals. So I need to reach out to people that do specialize in that field because that is not my field of specialty. My field of specialty is behavior change and teaching people how to change behavior, understanding the use of applied behavior analysis and bringing that into common everyday terms. So it's easy for everybody to understand. Yes, depression and critters is a great topic. I'm going to talk about, I want to bring somebody on to talk about depression and um, anxiety, frustration. I was just listening to something the other day about frustration in animals. When and That's why here we do not have, um, we don't give an end of training signal. We do not do that on purpose. And um, that's because... Do you work with reptiles? We were just talking about this. We are contemplating and we have been, yes, I have worked with different reptiles, especially with different zoos. Um, um, I've trained several different reptiles. I help, I've helped a couple different zoos with their tortoises, um, bearded dragons. Um, and we are contemplating bringing in a bearded dragon. But one thing I was going to say is, um, when we tend to stop the training is when the behavior issues start to rise. That's what we see here. And some of those birds, I mean, animals, sorry, I was just thinking about birds. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> some of those animals we're seeing here at the Animal Behavior Center that are starting to have some behavior concerns are Milo. Um, I have Ken McCourt written down. Michael is a good one. Um, yeah, that's a good one too, Nancy. Jennifer Ackerman, um, who wrote that I'm going to say, is it The Genius of Birds? I need to go back through the books that I read. Yep, Genius of Birds. I read that book too. Imagine that. Um, so the behavior issues we see here arise are in the ones that we haven't trained as much. And it's usually because we'll stop the training because, or ease up on the training because there's another animal that needs more of our focus. Ken Ramirez, I'll write that down as well. Um, I know Ken, several of us do. Um, that's when we see the behavior issues arise. So a couple of the animals that are we're having behavior concerns and starting behavior modification plans with right now are Willie, the tur education turkey vulture. Um, it's not okay, on my opinion, just to just leave an animal in an enclosure. That animal needs to be engaged mentally and physically. If you do not engage them mentally and physically, it will impact their quality of life. You will see things start up such as ARBs, abnormal repetitive behaviors, which that is an area that I love. That is my, in the world of behavior, those are the behaviors that 
get me the most motivated. Those abnormal repetitive behaviors um, or some people call them stereotypical behaviors. I like to call them abnormal repetitive because they are something you wouldn't see in the wild. And that's due to uh, usually lack of choice, lack of enrichment uh, when in our care. So when I see an animal with an abnormal repetitive behavior, I zone in on that animal and the reinforcer behind me zoning in and putting in a behavior modification plan in place is because I want to see the stress and the anxiety eliminated from that animal's life the best of my ability. And I do that through training. And I, that is the only reason I train because, uh, and I do that in, in, through enrichment and I do that, I focus because I want to empower that animal. Um, and pretty much every animal we brought in here that has an ARB, abnormal repetitive behavior, we are able to redirect or eliminate a couple that have abnormal repetitive behaviors here that came to us with um, those ARBs. Um, ARBs is, are so common in parrots in the companion world and in educational. Um, you'll see a lot of ARBs in um, different organizations and it's due to like a common ARB you will see in a particular animal is a polar bear. They have, they need hundreds of miles to roam and you do not get that, they cannot have that when they are specifically under our care if they're in an organization. Um, but that's where the enrichment and the training redirects that behavior. You can change those ARBs. Um, I've seen it several times and we implement it a lot. Um, but what I was going to say as well is um, if you guys have questions, Start popping them up there. I'm happy to address. And one of the things I was going to say is we do not intentionally have, um, we do not give an end of training signal because studies show that if you're actually using positive reinforcement training, it's the animal's preferred form of enrichment. Why would they want that to stop? The animals here show us that they get excited when the training session gets ready to start because we give different cues through our body language that that training session is getting ready to start. Whether that cue is we're approaching their enclosure. That's why I say never stand in front of enclosure if you don't plan on training that animal because you standing in front of that enclosure is usually a key. I'm getting ready to come in and our training is getting ready to start um, or actively begin our training between our focus can training between you and I is getting ready to begin. So when I leave, there's different things we do to redirect the animal's attention. Um, so they don't, get frustrated and see, and so we don't see uh, in, uh, any anxiety building up due to the training session, getting ready to start. Depending on the animal you're training, if you're, tra if you're in there saying, okay, we're done now, um, you can put your life in danger. Um, so that is why we do not give an end of training signal. So your guys, your questions are coming in. Um, let me see, because I am going to highlight. Um, okay. Let's bring up Lori has a question. Um, Willie or Shelty Doji passed in May. So Willow has become snippy around other dogs, which she has never done before and how to correct this behavior. First of all, Lori, um, before I address any behavior issue or consult with anybody on a behavior concern, um, especially when you're talking about something like this, I would say make sure your dog is not ill and has been seen by a veterinarian 
because nipping behavior is one of several. I know there's a couple different dog trainers, professional dog trainers on here as well. Feel free to comment and interact. I know Lydia's on here. Um, I know Deb Jones was on here. Um, and I, free, I apologize if um, I'm not mentioning the other professional dog trainers that are on here. <clears throat> Nipping can be a sign of discomfort, pain. Um, so make sure that the dog is not in any type of discomfort or pain. Okay, Lori is saying she is perfectly healthy, and I'm going to assume, yep, yeah, so Deb says, um, yep, yeah, always check physical possibilities first. Um, and, you know, panting can be another sign of pain. Um, so how do you, she's never done this before, and how do you correct this behavior? Correct, I would say um, that I would say change that behavior. The reason I wouldn't say correct, Lori, and the only reason I'm saying this is because um, that behavior is serving a purpose for that animal. Just because, good morning, Kimberly, just because an animal gives a behavior that we may not want to see does not mean it doesn't serve a purpose for that animal. That behavior, okay, um, that behavior um, serves a purpose for the animal. It may not be. Um, it may not be increasing quality of life or it may not be good to the group of animals and people you have as a whole. So one of the things I would do is, number one, trainer. You guys always hear me say, in order to change an undesired behavior, you must replace that behavior. You can't, I mean, a lot of times if we just try to stop the behavior, talk about frustration, anxiety, you can see a lot of frustration and anxiety if you just try to get an animal to stop behavior. What you want to try to do, my approach would be to um, first ask yourself, what else do you want the dog to do instead? And something else is identify the reinforcer behind the undesired behavior. Um, what is causing that undesired behavior to happen? You have to be creative and sit back. And this is what I do is I just sit back and I watch the undesired behavior. If I can get the undesired behavior on recording, that allows me numerous times to rewatch it because you don't want that undesired behavior to keep happening because the longer it happens, the longer your history of reinforcement and the longer it's going to take you to change it. And you guys always hear me say, once you learn two plus two equals four, you can't unlearn that. What uh, Once your dog knows that that nipping behavior brings a desired consequence, Daphne, She's in Key West. I was supposed to be meeting her down there in Key West right now. Um, Wadana says, look for an antecedent. Absolutely. Um, Eva says, is it fair to say, Laura, that all behavior, um, <clears throat> let me hide this real quick and go to what Eva just said and highlight her comment. Is it fair to say, Laura, that all behavior is a communication? Shh, yeah, sure. Um, absolutely, Eva. Um, Training and behavior is always happening. Um, so it's whether we can identify the reinforcer behind it. So Deb Jones is on here. Um, she's a professional dog trainer. She says sometimes the dog is very confident with a stable companion, but not so much when alone. Yeah, so um, great point, Deb. So what I would suggest you do, Lori, is what ask yourself, what behavior do you want your dog to do instead? And I believe you just commented. If you can comment, uh, oh, no, I'll just highlight it right here. Lori says, I tried to downstay and she actually didn't listen. She laid there and growled. Okay, that's communication. That's body language and that's communication. If she laid there and growled that you may be taking too big of steps, jump back and it, it, just because you're using positive reinforcement does not mean it's a positive experience for the animal. So that is key. 
in watching your animal's behavior. Um, listening and watching what they are saying. So if she is growling while she's in a downstay, um, it may not be comfortable or it's too big of a step for her. It could actually be restricting her, which is where you can poison your cue, meaning pairing an aversive, something the animal doesn't like, um, with what you're actually trying to train, what you're trying to train. And it can make, it just can make the whole situation blow up in your face. We talk about that a lot in the memberships, poisoning the cue. We try to never pair the cues with any type of an aversive. If we do, if I see I'm trying to train an animal a behavior and it may not next, um, it may not necessarily be um, something it's comfortable with, you better back up right now. Back up because like I already said, once your dog learns two plus two equals four, it's not going to forget it. Now you have to counter condition that, meaning retrain. And the dog has already had that experience. The more intelligent the animal, um, there's so many different definitions of intelligence, but the more intelligent the animal, the quicker they pick up on a consequence of a behavior. And they will learn that fast if they want to do that behavior again or not. So be careful, Lori. Um, I would say back up in what you're asking, reshape, shaping mean um, reinforcing real small approximations. You're probably asking too big of a behavior from your animal. Start with something very easy. Putting a dog in a down position may not be comfortable in particular environments because a down position um, can restrict movement, um, can restrict choice. So maybe figure out something else. Teach it a station. Um, maybe train with. No, I'm not going to say that. I was going to say train with another dog, but I don't know. I would have to know so much more information before I could say that. Um, Deb shows that says that's brilliant. Just because you're using positive reinforcement doesn't mean it's a positive experience for the animal. That is true. Thanks, Daphne. Um, I see it all the time. I do it. I do it. Sometimes um, I get in the mindset where I get too focused on my training, the end result, what I think I know that animal is capable of. Um, and then I sit there and I push, I push, we can do this. We got this. Come on. We just did this. Let's go. Let's, you know, we can do this. Um, and then that the animal's body language is the punisher, the positive punisher for me, because I will see body language change in that animal. Like I've had enough. I'm not understanding. I'm getting frustrated. And that's like, that's when I say, whoa, okay, why am I actually doing this? Don't forget to me personally, I do this training because um, I want it to empower and increase choices in the animal's life. And when I start to push like that, um, that's when I say, just because you're using positive reinforcement doesn't necessarily mean it's a positive experience for the animal it starts turning slowly into negative reinforcement, meaning the animal starts doing it to escape, a con avoid a consequence. I don't, that's not relationship building. Um, and that is why I train because I want that relationship with that animal. Um, so maybe I'm going to say, I'm going to suggest to you, Lori, um, that you, Find another replacement behavior to train that your dog is more comfortable with. Um, your dog's comfortable. It's 14 years old. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not comfortable going in a down position. I don't know, Lori. I would have to get to know so much more information. Excuse me. Just did that on the live stream. Um, maybe look for a target, a hand target. Touch his nose to your hand. Good morning, Vicky. Touch his nose to your hand or teach a station. A station is a, is a target. I want all four feet right here, but the station is a target with duration. Uh, now stay there. Okay. And a lot of times I see people 
Um, here's another example of where just because you're using positive reinforcement doesn't mean it's a positive experience for the animal is I see people try to put an animal in a station for too long. A station is just a temporary behavior. Um, it's not to prevent an hour's, hour's worth of undesired behavior. You don't want to leave your dog in a station for an hour. You're definitely going to poison that cue. Um, we teach stations a lot to redirect behavior. We see an encounter between two animals getting ready to happen and it's not going to have a good consequence. So we tell them both to go to their stations and we do that temporarily and then we'll recall the one animal and put it in a safe place and then um, keep training the station over here for a short period of time and then redirect. Um, so I would suggest, Laurie, a target, a station. Um, I like the target. A target is teaching an animal to touch a particular body part to an object. I want your nose touching the palm of my hand or and I'm going to request that. I'm not going to command that because command is a word that has no place in the use of positive reinforcement. Because if you're commanding something, you're saying do this or else. That is actually a form of negative reinforcement if the animal actually does it. Um, I try to stay as far away from positive punishers and negative reinforcers as possible because they may work, but not without their consequences. I want that relationship with that animal. I want that body language of that animal to shine when we are in public. I want people looking at that animal and saying that is one hell of an excited, happy animal because the message is there saying this is the result of positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement, one of my taglines I used to say in my emails is positive reinforcement puts the animal's choice back into the equation of behavior modification. Um, okay, so I would start out with a different behavior, Lori. Let's move on. Um, Okie dokie. Let's touch on this one. Lois says, I have a disabled Moluccan cockatoo. If anybody doesn't know what a Moluccan cockatoo is that watches our live streams, that would be the same species of parrot that Rocky is, our 20-year-old shelter cockatoo. Um, when I hold her and move her around the house, she will bite me if she sees my six-month-old puppy. How do I stop the aggression? Um, be careful with the label of aggression, Lois. Um, Labels are something, descriptions, uh, adjectives that we put on animal behavior. We just talked about this yesterday, I believe, in level, level one. Um, labels can be inaccurate. And labels tend to let people think that they can't change the behavior. Um, so I want to focus on your word aggression. <clears throat> Based on what you just said, I would not call that bite aggression. I would call that bite is a form of communication to you and it's probably escalated to a bite because other behaviors your Moluccan has tried to convey to you via body language or vocalizations have not been accurately read. Um, this is not uncommon. And we just got done saying in the parrot project, one of the things I used to hear all the time is you're just going to get bit. No, no, no. We don't want to get bit around here. We don't like that kind of target training. <laughs> that bite serves a purpose. Pay attention to all the antecedents, antecedents meaning things um, that happen right before the behavior. For example, example, for example, Rocky, our 20-year-old Moluccan cockatoo, we brought home uh, when he was eight years old, and he had a heavy history of biting, lunging, chasing. Um, those could easily be labeled as aggression. I looked at that and said, this is a well-formed um, form of communication for this animal. Um, this animal has learned that that is what works. It is my job to step in now and teach it a different way of communication. So I would watch what Rocky would do right before he would chase me because I was his primary target. Um, 
I would watch what those behaviors looked like right before he would chase, lunge, or attempt to bite. Um, I did not get Rocky out of his cage until I knew I could safely, meaning safe for me and safe for him, train him to go back into his cage. I did the same thing with Coco, the umbrella cockatoo here. I did the same thing with Willie, the turkey vulture. I do the same thing with pigs. Um, I do the same thing with any animal. And one of the first things I will teach them is a target. So I can, um, target training helps me read the behavior of an animal if I do not understand that behavior. This week we have a two month old porcupine getting ready to come in for training. I don't know anything about porcupine behavior. That is on purpose why I'm bringing it in. So I'm gonna show people in level two membership project how I learn. It's not necessarily about the species or, or the species of animal. It's about, I need to understand your body language. How do I do that? I do that through training. And I usually start out with a target and a recall off contact. Um, so back to what you were saying with Rocky, uh, or with your Moluccan cockatoo, um, I would watch that animal's body language before it showed the undesired behaviors. I didn't know what the undesired behaviors looked like until they started happening. And I was like, well, what's this behavior we got going on here? Well, that didn't end very nicely. Nicely meaning it wasn't <laughs> a good outcome for me. Um, it's probably not a good outcome for the animal, especially if I'm trying to build a relationship with it. So I had to experience those things first to see what that behavior looked like to understand that, um, Okay, I don't want that happening again. So sit back. How am I going to put a behavior mo modification plan in place? One of the things, once I was able to pick Rocky up, um, so we were having 100% physical contact at that point. Um, you watch for the body language, especially with a Moluccan cockatoo, when they are not comfortable, um, their feather placement changes. They have those beak mufflers. Those are usually up when they're content or sleepy. And if you see a Moluccan cockatoo that's doing this, and then all of a sudden the feathers go whoosh, and they tuck in and all the feather placement pulls in tight, you'll see body posture change. It either stands straight up, right? Because if they had that opportunity, they're taking a look at what's going on in the environment. Are they comfortable? If they're not comfortable, they're getting ready to book it. And in our care, a lot of times um, their form of locomotion is different. Um, they don't have as many choices. Um, this is why I try to show people how to live with animals by keeping, live with birds by not clipping their wings. Um, because once you clip those wings, it doesn't, all you're doing is changing the, the animal's body part, not, you are, you're modifying body parts, not behavior. And a lot of times, if you are not modifying the behavior and you're implementing restrictions, you're going to see frustration and anxiety skyrocket. And when those two skyrocket, that is when people label it as aggression. So um, it looks it based on what you're telling me, Lois, is this is based out of it could be based out of fear. And it's happening because all former forms of communication and interaction ha did not work for the animal. So. Um, pay close attention to that. OK teach it another behavior. So to go back, because I don't have any more examples from you, Lois, so I'm gonna use an example from me with Rocky. Um, Rocky used to slide down his cage when I would walk in the room and he would chase me. Um, so I started redirecting because I knew he liked to, he liked to chase uh, different toys. You could be reinforcing a chase or you could be redirecting behavior. I chose to use it because it worked. It was something the animal already did. So when I would walk in the room, I'd be prepared. I had a ball in my hand. I would throw a ball on the floor. You would see Rocky come down and look at me and then say, Phew! and he would chase the ball. And then I would 
heavily positively reinforce that behavior. But something else Rocky does is I taught him a way to tell me, no, I am not comfortable. And what he did, and I did that just by watching his body language. So he's on me. Um, I would stand with him on me. And a lot of times with birds, raptors, uh, any type of bird, I will keep my elbow bent and tucked into my side because a lot of times people will have a bird right here and I shape my hand based on the size of their feet. So Rocky is a big bird. I want him to have a good grip. Um, keep your elbow bent because a lot of times I see people go like this. That just gives the bird a straight shot to your shoulder. If you are not comfortable, that is why I teach a target. Bird's beak starts looking towards your shoulder. Redirect it with a target over here. Instead of telling him what you don't want to do, I don't want him to do this, but I'm not going to tell him no because the word no, I'm not giving him anything else to do. That can cause frustration and anxiety. So that's why I teach a target before the bird gets on my hand. Um, so I can redirect behavior and what Rocky will do to tell me, no, I'm okay with the animal telling me, no, I need to know you are not comfortable with this. If it is a behavior you need to do, that just tells me we need to take some serious steps back. Training needs to happen. Um, but I need you to tell me, no, I need you to tell me, no, whether that's through, um, a scream a growl, um, I'm going to pay attention to those behaviors because those are telling me that the animal is not comfortable. But one thing Rocky does, and this is all based on the individual animal, you can't just use this because it's a Moluccan cockatoo and it works across the species because it, it doesn't. Each animal is its individual, just like we are. But one thing Rocky would do is he would turn his head towards me and then he'd hit, he'd hit his beak to my shoulder. I was just like, whoa, I don't know what that means, but I'm going to take it as you're not comfortable. So I created that contingency. Contingency meaning if this, then this. If I feel this, I am backing away from whatever is new in the environment. And the more I did that, creating that contingency, the better line of communication that developed between Rocky and I. So when Rocky does this to me, that means no. That means, what does no mean? No means I am not comfortable with whatever you're approaching or wherever you're taking me or something new that has come into this environment. So I'm going to identify as fast as possible what is it that just happened in the environment. And I am either going to remove whatever that is or I'm removing us. Um, does that make sense? Um, there's so many comments happening. Um, does that make sense? That's why I say, always say, in order to stop an undesired behavior, you need to identify what is the reinforcer behind that undesired behavior. It may be undesired um, from us, but it serves a purpose for the animal. Find out what purpose that serves for the animal, because once you find out what that purpose is, now you've identified the reinforcer. Once you have the reinforcer behind the undesired behavior, now you have the tools to use to change it. OK, let's replace this behavior. Um, and then the longer the undesired behavior has happened, usually what I find is. Um, especially with parrots, because they live 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, um, the longer that undesired behavior has happened, it usually has to be on some type of maintenance plan. Meaning um, like Rocky is out there um, vocalizing and due to past experiences, I know what body language and what actions he's doing with that vocalization. His ARBs are coming back into place, abnormal repetitive behavior. Um, Okay, hang on a second, Lois, because I want to expand on that. Um, that is an abnormal repetitive behavior with a history of lack of enrichment prior to coming to me. Um, lack of enrichment, lack of choice, seeing something and not being able to get it, anticipation. Um, so those behaviors, his ARBs, 
I, those will never, to the best of my knowledge, 100% go away. They will have to be on a maintenance plan. And what I see with Rocky's ARBs is something that is very common in the citizen, the parrot community, which is separation anxiety. Separation anxiety is not an easy behavior to change. And a lot of times with your separation anxiety, you've got maintenance plans. So um, the reason it's one of the hardest is because it takes continual work, um, data, uh, documentation, observation. Watch those distant antecedents coming. Like he'll start picking his toenail. And when I see him start picking his toenail, I was like, if I don't interact, and redirect this behavior right now, within two weeks, we're going to see ARBs starting to go out of control. He does this spin in his cage. So Lois says, I will work on targeting while holding. Not just that, Lois, I'm going to give you some advice. I would also work on, this is why I say, keep your animals used to change. You can keep this, you can keep your animals used to change in so many different ways. We just talked about this the other day in the parrot project with a blind macaw. OK, it cannot see introduce change in a really slow pace. And when you're introducing change, positively reinforce their staying calm during that change. Once you have an animal that's used to change, you have an animal that's set up for success um, and won't be as stressed when things change in its environment. So you say you'll work on targeting while holding. Also, your Moluccan cockatoo. I am going to say it is probably fearful of your puppy. Pay attention to that. Um, puppies have a lot of energy. Your Moluccan may not understand that. It's too much movement and too much energy for your Moluccan. It is not calm. And I always tell people, where do you begin? Reinforce calm. Um, keep your puppy in the other room, behind a gate. Um, start as far away as possible. Your bird will tell you where to start. Understand what calm body language looks like and reinforce that calm body language as uh, your target that you're training, Lewis, could just be two feet on my arm. So you don't necessarily need to get him to touch his beak to a stick. This is a target. Um, Asking for a particular body peg to touch an object, two feet on my arm, that's a target. And then that's a station. Okay. Um, reinforce calm in very small steps. Um, I also don't recommend different species interacting with each other. We just got done talking about this. I just shared a video on my personal Facebook page the other day that um, I was like, this could probably start some controversy, but I'm sharing it anyways, because there's a very powerful message here. And it was dogs <clears throat> and pigs playing together. I shared that video and said, this is an extremely dangerous video to be sharing. This may look cute. Take the anthropomorphism out of it, because cute kills. Um, I know too many dogs that have um, severely disfigured pigs and have killed pigs. Um, so do we keep multiple animals here? Yes, we do. And we always plan for an accident and um, we never leave animals out unsupervised and we make sure dogs are moved, birds come out, um, vultures moved, pig comes out, something like that. Okay. Um, so a lot of the time it's the people that need train. It's Tim, where are you? That's what it is all the time. That's what it is all of the time. It is our job as professional trainers to teach the people and give them the information they need to keep the best quality of health and care of the animals in um, our care. Um, yeah, Mano says, Mano is a wildlife uh, educator focusing on raptors with Ohio Nature Education out of Johnstown, Ohio. I know, I know the viewers and the followers here. I like to get to know you. She is also the one that brought Bellatrix, the Eurasian Eagle Owl, here for training. And she says, like all the videos on Facebook of people petting owls, that is a stupid 
video to be sharing. <laughs> I'm sorry, probably not very professional for me to say that, but it's mostly people don't, and I'm not knocking the people that share it. They just don't understand yet. So we can educate them. Um, those videos of people, uh, the kid petting the snowy owl on the head, that is an extremely dangerous animal. I mean, not dangerous animal. That's an animal showing all kinds of forms of communication that is being ignored because it does that, that five-year-old kid does not understand. I'm not sure why a five-year-old kid is interacting with an adult snowy owl anyways. Um, but that bird showed signs that owl was clacking its beak. That is a clear sign. I am not comfortable. I am nervous. And, um, she was kissing the owl and the owl was beaking her face may look like to the person that doesn't know owl behavior that this may look like a kiss. That's not a kiss. <laughs> That's a target. <laughs> That's going to end up bad. And I probably wouldn't doubt that that little girl got footed, meaning that's a big talons on that foot. And if this doesn't work and this doesn't work, just like the growl, um, and then this, if this doesn't work, that animal's going to move to what works. And that snowy owl probably moved to like this. And what is right in front of that owl's form reach, that kid's face. And what's probably going to happen is that owl's going to be put down mm -hmm. for the uneducated. Yes, and the animal gets put down and blamed. So when your dog growls at you, pay attention to it. That growl is a form of communication. And um, with that being said, it's the end of the hour. I've got my volunteers ready to come in. So if you guys, if you guys like this content that you see every week on Coffee with the Critters, I highly suggest you go to our website and take a look at our memberships and projects. Those are all online learning annual subscriptions to weekly, if not daily, um, live streams, monthly Q and A's. We have projects coming up. You get free webinars. Um, we are very interactive and engaging. We have level one for the companion animal community, uh, level two for the professional trainer or those that want to know more about getting into the field of working with animal behavior using applied behavior analysis. We have the projects which they can be bundled. Um, if you are a member, you get your projects at half off. You do not need to be a member. You can go straight into a project. What a project is, is species specific. We have the parrot project and um, the pig project, the deaf dog project and the snow project. Judy says, love the learning experiences here. Great. Um, and um, yeah, we have projects. We have readings going on in there. And thank you, Mano, very much. If you guys need to get a hold of me, our website is theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Thank you, Lori. I'm glad I got to address your question. You go to theanimalbehaviorcenter.com, you're going to see a facelift on our website in 2018. Happy New Year's Eve, everybody. Um, there's my email directly if you need to get a hold of me. Lois, you are extremely welcome. And for those of you that attended, um, that just because I talked about a dog and a parrot in these, this Q&A. The approaches are the same, our functional assessments. Um, yeah. So anyways, Happy New Year's Eve, everybody. I will see you guys in 2018. Thank you for your sharing and help spreading the word of the good work we do. Not me. We. All right. Happy New Year, everybody. Talk to you next year.